Good afternoon, dear students, dear minister who is with us, as I understand, dear ambassador, and uh, my, my dear students. Um, today I would like to welcome you at the sixth climate transition lecture. Today uh, this uh, uh, climate transition lecture will be given by Mr. Viktor Parlicov, Minister of Energy of Moldova. Um, here at Natalin, you will hear many times during uh, academic curricula, but also during extra uh, academic cu curricula, you will uh, hear many times geopolitics uh, and the consequences of um, the full invasion um, of Russia in Ukraine. You will be more and more acquainted with this. Um, so today also, we will, this is a departure point. Uh, the departure point is that as the consequence of the changing of geopolitics because of the full scale invasion of Russia in Ukraine, Moldova as a neighboring country has been among those which were the most affected. Um, that is why Moldova was forced uh, to rethink its energy dependence on Russia, which was minister for sure will, will say it in more details, but almost 100% dependence uh, on, 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 uh, on energy sources from, from Russia. So you can only imagine the situation in which Moldova uh, was found itself after the Russian invasion and uh, constant threat uh, also sent to Moldova. And then, as I said, Moldova decided to uh, rethink its, uh, to, to, change it, uh, to change it and to reverse uh, this dependence on Russia. And uh, as I understand, Moldova uh, decided to, 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 to do it and uh, considered that the only um, credible and the best way would be following um, the path of the European integration. And it seems to be clear that uh, the diversification of energy, of Moldova's energy supply, would not be possible without the support of the European Union and Energy Community Secretariat. That is why today uh, this meeting will be uh, moderated by Ambassador Lorkowski, Director of the Energy Community Secretariat, who has been involved in this process, I would say, every day. However, today's, uh, today's guest of honor uh, during our lecture is Mr. Parlicov, Minister of Energy of Moldova, if you Allow me, I would like to introduce him to you. He's a former, Mr. Parlicov is a former director of the Green City Lab Association. He's an expert in energy, climate, and sustainable development policies. In the period of 2010-14, he held the position of director general of the National Agency for Energy Regulation and is an honorary member of the Regional Association of Energy Regulators. In over 20 years of experience, he has done business consulting, industry, agriculture, and energy, as I understand, and analysis and expertise activities in the field of public policies, both for local and central public authorities, as well as for international institutions. As I said, after the lecture, you will have a chance uh, to ask uh, questions and then this part of today's meeting, uh, question and answers session, as I said, will be moderated by the director of um, Energy Community uh, Secretariat. The minister, uh, good afternoon. The floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, I hope you hear me well. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the honor to speak uh, in front of uh, this distinguished audience. Uh, 
uh, dear Mr. Lorkowski, thank you very much as well. Uh, it's uh, great to be to see you at least in uh, uh, online. Um, so I will start because the initial uh, topic was the climate transition, but then uh, the intro is more on the uh, energy and geopolitics. And um, I will probably start from the second and then go to the first, because that's how our um, thinking and that's how our um, um, yeah, uh, energy sector is now uh, evolving. Um, I will start by saying that, uh, of course, it's not a secret that uh, uh, energy and uh, politics are tightly interrelated. Moreover, for Russia, particularly uh, energy and particularly gas uh, and the role of Gazprom was for a long time um, uh, a means of doing uh, uh, diplomacy. It's basically a, um, a tool for uh, doing, uh, let's say, uh, for, for political, uh, promoting political interests. And that has been not very, uh, let's say, quickly uh, grabbed and not very quickly understood uh, by many uh, of the uh, consumers of the Russian gas, including in Europe. Uh, for us, uh, all these things have been uh, quite uh, immediate after our independence. For us, it was pretty clear from the very beginning, um, because just a couple of uh, words about what is the Moldovan energy sector like and uh, how is it functioning. And at some point I was saying that you cannot understand anything about the Moldovan energy sector here, geopolitics uh, uh, steps in, without understanding the interlinkages between uh, energy sector and the separatist uh, region in our country, which is Transnistria. Uh, you may have heard of this tiny piece of land uh, sandwiched between Moldova and Ukraine, uh, which um, still is a so-called uh, cold uh, conflict, and unresolved, and uh, uh, we had a, uh, let's say, a, a short but relatively uh, vehement uh, war uh, in 1992. Um, and still this region is controlled by the uh, Russian Federation. They still um, uh, have their troops placed there, uh, and they still, uh, the authorities of the region, uh, in many respects, serve as proxies of the Russian, uh, Russian government. Now, uh, if we, if we, uh, why am I mentioning this Transnistria, and why am I mentioning it in relation to energy? Because basically, uh, energy was the main instrument through which Transnistria was uh, used uh, in order to keep Moldova into the, in the Russian orbit of influence. Basically, the whole model was very, very simple. Uh, Gazprom was supplying gas to Moldova, uh, including the gas that went to the Transnistrian region was supplied de facto for free. So it's counted as if, uh, you know, it's invoiced, but they have no problem if this is not uh, paid. And uh, if you take a look at what happened uh, is uh, over since 1990s, the total amount of debt accumulated in that region uh, currently probably amounts to, uh, amounts to uh, almost 10 billion US dollars. And we're talking about a region inhabited by about 300,000 people now. Uh, so the whole model uh, which Russia developed to keep Transnistria uh, as an, an instrument to influence Moldova and keep Moldova in, the, in, the, in its orbit was by shoveling in de facto free gas into the region and then transforming this gas in a number of creative ways into economy, into jobs, into exports um, for uh, maintaining, for upkeeping that region. Uh, instead of paying money to people, instead of paying uh, other sorts of you know, uh, contributions, they basically developed a model in which 
they finance the region through, through de facto free gas. And why is this important? Because it's also uh, uh, key to understand that from the Soviet uh, period, uh, the energy infrastructure uh, in Moldova, in the former Soviet Socialist Republic of Moldova, was built so that uh, a lot of the critical infrastructure is actually located in the Transnistrian region. The biggest power plant, um, which is about 2.4 gigawatts, uh, is located in Transnistria. Uh, six out of seven uh, lines that are interconnecting us with uh, Ukraine, I mean high voltage lines, uh, go through the Transnistrian region. And uh, in many respects, uh, the, the, the compression, the pumping station or, or gas, the main one located in Transnistrian region. So. In many respects, Moldova, uh, on the energy level, was not capable of uh, maintaining the stability of its energy system without uh, appealing and without uh, depending on, uh, on the Transnistrian region, which was controlled by, by Russia. Uh, and that has been speculated in many ways. Uh, we have been, uh, we've experienced uh, disconnections of electricity in the 90s. Uh, uh, we have at least one or two governments that have been changed uh, in Moldova uh, as a result of uh, energy crisis triggered uh, by the Russians through the Transnistrian regions. So it's been a very powerful tool, uh, very instrumental for the Russian Federation to influence the course of things uh, in the entire Moldova, not uh, just in the region. Uh, and the way it in it interlinks is that, of course, when you are 100% dependent on gas supplied by Gazprom, and we wouldn't have been the only country in the region uh, in that situation, but uh, we were probably among the most vulnerable in this respect, probably together with Montenegro and a couple of others. Uh, we have absolutely no gas of our own, uh, and we were fully, and we didn't have uh, at the, until very recently. Uh, any options and any opportunities to bring in gas from other sources than, uh, than from east, from Gazprom. Uh, so uh, that dependency has been uh, heavily uh, instrumentalized by uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, and uh, basically the model was the following. They shoveled in the free gas. Uh, from that free gas, uh, de facto free. Uh, the Transnistrian region was, of course, extremely competitive in producing electricity. Uh, and uh, the entire or most of the electricity supply to uh, Moldova traditionally, or to the rest of Moldova, was traditionally done by that power plant. But the money that consumers uh, were paying for this uh, electricity uh, a big chunk of this money actually went to directly subsidize the, the budget of the Transnistrian region. I won't explain in excruciating details how it was structured, but just, uh, uh, just for you to know that the, the gas was flowing de facto free into the region. That region produced also electricity for the rest of Moldova. And that money that we paid was actually uh, feeding the uh, budget of the Transnistrian region. And that was a perfect model for upkeeping and for maintaining the uh, illusion of an independence uh, in the region. Uh, however, due to uh, diversification, due to new markets, due to the fact that uh, we have been not once blackmailed by uh, uh, Russian Federation and Gazprom, and due to the efforts that we made in terms of diversification of our sources. Uh, now, basically, Russia is trapped in its own trap. Uh, because since this winter, since 2022, December, we're buying zero gas from Gazprom for the territory that we, the, the constitutional authorities control. Basically, the only gas from Gazprom is still going to the Transnistrian region. Um, we have managed to secure uh, the uh, supply of gas from different sources, 
so we can now bring in gas to Moldova due to reverse flow on the Trans-Balkan pipeline, due to interconnection between Romania and Moldova. We can now bring in gas from a number of different sources and we, cannot, we, we are not dependent, dependent on uh, Russian gas uh, alone. Uh, in the same time, one extremely important element has happened after the war in Ukraine was uh, uh, launched by Putin. And that is, um, by the way, it's interesting for, for it's interesting to know. Uh, not many people pay attention to that, but uh, energy uh, has also some symbolic moments in this respect as well. Um, you know, uh, electricity grids of Ukraine and Moldova were part of the former Soviet uh, electricity grids, and they were not synchronized with the rest of Europe. So basically, there was no energy, electricity uh, exchange between the main part of Ukraine, uh, there was one island connected to the rest of Europe, the uh, main part of Ukraine and Moldova with the European system. We were only connected to the former Russia, Belarus, etc., etc. So in order to prepare for synchronization from disconnection from uh, uh, Russia and uh, Belarus, and connecting to uh, European grids, uh, it was scheduled to run, it's a typical procedure, sometimes takes uh, many, many years, but there's several steps to, to, to follow. And one of these steps is you have to disconnect your systems, Moldova and Ukraine in this case, from the other systems, so you're not connected to to the uh, uh, European system, you're not connected to the Russian and Belarus system, and you have to prove that you can maintain the stability of your electric system for some time. And you have to run two of these tests, one of them in winter, then one of them in summer, then typically you would receive some homework from the uh, European uh, uh, grid operators, TSOs, and then maybe after 5, 10, 15 years, you're getting connected and synchronized with, uh, with the rest of the Europe. Now, what happened uh, and why is that symbolic for, for uh, the war in Ukraine? Because actually this winter test was scheduled, and everybody knew that, the Russians knew it, uh, or to start on 24th of uh, February 2022. So on 1 a.m. Uh, local time, in 2022, on 24th of uh, February, uh, the Ukrainian and Moldovan grids disconnected from the Russians, and a number of hours after, Putin launched its attacks. And if you look at the uh, where he attacked, a lot of that will be connected to energy, nuclear power stations primarily. Uh, and here, what happened is an extremely courageous, and at the same time, a uh, purely political decision that was made in Brussels. Because what typically takes years was decided in Brussels in a, in a matter of three weeks. So after three weeks, and this, of course, it's not a surprise that on the two days or three days after the war began, the Ukrainians simply refused to reconnect to the Russian and Belarus grids. Uh, and we were basically in the most vulnerable situation, suspended as an island, uh, energy island, between the two biggest systems. Uh, however, uh, on 16th of March, uh, the European Union allowed for this, basically, synchronization, so that the grids of Ukraine and Moldova connect to the European grid and become part of the uh, continental European energy system. And that's what kept the lights on in Ukraine uh, after the Russians launched their attacks in October 2022. And that's what changed the whole dynamics in Moldova around uh, security of electricity supply and su maintaining the stability of our energy system uh, regardless of actions undertaken by the Transnistrian region. Because due to this interconnection and synchronization with, uh, with the European uh, grids, 
we were no longer that dependent. There's still some dependencies in Moldova with the Transnistrian infrastructure, but we're much less vulnerable to this blackmail. And that allowed us to move ahead much quicker than previously. So uh, in, uh, uh, since December 2022, uh, we buy no gas from Gazprom for the territory we control. Uh, moreover, uh, Energocom, which is a state-owned company which is used by the government to basically substitute the incumbent supplier of gas, which is a, a subsidiary of Gazprom called Moldova Gas. Uh, and uh, Energocom, this state-owned company, started to bring in gas from other sources. Uh, and surprise, surprise, uh, we, were, we managed to buy gas on the European market actually cheaper than uh, the price that we would have in accordance with the Gazprom's formula. So Gazprom is selling, was selling gas to Moldova Gas based on a formula price, and we managed to buy gas from European market actually cheaper than prices in accordance to, with that formula. Uh, and that is a tremendous breakthrough. Now we are in the midst of a basically hybrid war, in the midst of an of a, uh, information war, where basically Gazprom and the Russian Federation is trying to uh, decredibilize and to undermine and to, uh, yeah, uh, all the key pillars, the key elements on which this diversification and energy security is built. Basically, the main narrative, particularly in the last days, is uh, that Moldova is buying gas from European market, but this is also Gazprom's gas. It's again Gazprom's gas, uh, and we pay an additional, we, we pay more for this gas, we pay an additional premium price for this gas because it goes through European intermediaries. So all these sorts of narratives uh, are being kind of launched in the public space in order to uh, undermine the basics of, uh, of um, uh, diversification and uh, the main elements of our energy security. So now that this, let's say, the, the, the general uh, context uh, I hope is more or less clear, and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to take questions afterwards. Uh, I can uh, talk more about what we have actually done to achieve it, what, what has happened. Because in 2021, 2022, Moldova had absolutely zero experience in buying both gas and electricity from uh, other sources than Gazprom and electricity from uh, uh, Transnistria and or Ukraine. Uh, we had to develop the, those uh, skills, that we have to develop those uh, you know, uh, capacities uh, on the go. And uh, it was extremely, uh, it was, it would have been impossible without extremely uh, timely, quick, and multilateral support from the EU. And the main thing I want to start with is the political support. Um, again, had it not been for a political decision to allow for the synchronization of grids between Ukraine, Moldova, and the European grids, uh, probably Ukraine would have been in darkness uh, until very recently, and Moldova would have been in the same situation as Ukraine. Uh, it's largely due to that political decision that our technical, physical grids are, uh, are coping. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, Brussels very quickly deployed a number of ex experts, a number of consultants that helped us develop extremely quickly this capacity. So uh, there were consultants that helped us to uh, buy gas on the international market. Again, if you're a new company, uh, you yourself, you, if you want, it's, it may sound very strange to someone who's in Poland, but if you're in Moldova and you're uh, sending a, a request for, oh, please sell me 10 million cubic meters of gas, uh, I need it, uh, then probably at best your message gets into spam. 
because there's no one, no one uh, expecting uh, to, uh, there's no trader who had ever had any experience in delivering gas to Moldova or anywhere close. Uh, so we had these consultants that helped us buy gas. Last year, the Russians again tried some blackmail and uh, they reduced the amount of gas that's supplied to Moldova and the Transnistrian uh, region basically said, okay, we're not going to supply electricity to you. Uh, we have no, not sufficient gas, we need this gas for our consumers, so we're not going to supply electricity to uh, the rest of Moldova. And again, uh, with support from international community, uh, we, had, uh, uh, we have managed, uh, and it took one month, uh, we've managed to buy all our electricity from the regional market. We basically bought, uh, bought it from Romanian market. And it was November 2022, if you remember, those was the probably historically highest prices for energy ever. That's why what I'm saying here is the first part is the, the political support, the support from the, the technical assistance, the knowledge support, but also extremely important, our prices uh, skyrocketed. Our internal prices for energy skyrocketed. Uh, the gas prices increased about seven times in the meantime. Uh, we haven't uh, capped these uh, prices as many, many countries in Europe did. We didn't have the budget to, to, to pay for it. And we don't have our own gas. Uh, uh, electricity prices in that month when we uh, bought only from the European market and there was peak prices all over, um, increased about three to fourfold. Uh, and that was, the last winter was historically the most difficult winter for our households in terms of their energy prices and energy bills. And here again uh, comes the international support. Uh, European Union uh, supported uh, the Moldovan budget with about 250 million euro. Uh, the uh, U.S. government uh, also supported Moldova uh, and the budget uh, with another a couple of hundred million dollars. And what we managed to do within, again, within one year during 2022, uh, expecting that such scenarios may occur, we developed a very uh, flexible system of on-bill compensations for the consumers. And basically, Despite uh, prices skyrocketing, we were managed. We managed to uh, compensate the largest bit of this increase, uh, particularly on gas, less so on electricity, uh, but on gas and on district heating, on central heating, we managed to compensate uh, around 40 to 50 percent of uh, households' bills. Uh, that actually, even with that. Uh, the bills for uh, our uh, consumers were unbearable for uh, for many families, and they still are grieving for and uh, and very very. If you if you look in our polls, one of the most um, uh, one of the biggest fear uh, that exists is that the next winter we will have the same situation. That the next winter energy prices will again be huge. And the, 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 the pe people will not be able to cope with them. Now, and here we're, uh, this is a very, let's say, natural uh, uh, switch, a natural uh, uh, passage to what we are focusing on. And here is where the climate transition uh, and uh, the uh, decarbonization uh, has a role. Basically, one of the main reasons uh, why uh, our uh, energy bills are so high and why it's so difficult uh, for the country to cope with, uh, uh, with high prices is in addition to uh, prices which were high for, for, for the entire Europe, uh, uh, extremely low energy efficiency. Moldova uh, in Moldova, uh, all, over 50% of all its energy, from its energy balance, is consumed in buildings. 
of course, largely most of it in households, also public buildings, also business, but households are the most. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we spend about 2 to 2.5 times more energy to upkeep one square meter of the building compared to other countries in Europe. Which means that our bills are high not only because the prices are high, but because the efficiency of energy consumption is extremely low, because a lot of this energy is wasted. So basically, if you look at what the government subsidized in last years, was largely the subsidies for the energy wasted. Had we had less energy consumed by the, to maintain the same level of comfort, we would need probably twice uh, as little money to compensate the bills. Uh, maybe even more. So when it comes to the priorities for the long term, it's not by surprise that uh, priority number one in terms of decarbonization uh, for the next years is uh, energy efficiency of the buildings. And in that respect, we're basically uh, developing and creating uh, um, two financial instruments, one dedicated to households and one dedicated to public sector. Uh, and they are uh, different in nature, but uh, target the same uh, target the same uh, purpose. Uh, they are meant to trigger investments in energy efficiency. And when it comes to uh, public buildings, it's uh, more direct. Basically, we want to structure. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concept of ESCO or super ESCO, but basically, uh, what we want to do is a government-to-government -government super ESCO. Uh, for the public buildings. What it means in essence is that the government, Ministry of Finance in that respect, uh, brings in or uh, is attracting long-term financing, concessional loans, and uh, these loans invested in energy efficiency of the buildings uh, generate savings. And the loans are actually repaid with the savings that uh, the, uh, the public sector incurs due to this investment. So this is, a, simply speaking, a model in which in, in, in energy markets, they, also, they are often called ESCOs, but uh, the model in which uh, you can accelerate investment in energy uh, efficiency of public buildings uh, by providing a very clear source for repayment of these loans uh, to the international uh, creditor. Second uh, uh, instrument is targeting the energy efficiency in residential sector. And uh, that is similar to what has been, what is being done in many other countries. Basically, it's a subsidy for the households who choose to invest in their uh, in their energy efficiency of their uh, of their buildings of their houses, uh, and here is there is a lot of work to be done with the banks uh, to connect it to uh, uh, dedicated uh, financing uh, instrument uh, that the banks can provide, and also uh, there's a lot to be worked uh, at the level of uh, condominiums, particularly with condominiums because. An investment in energy in the insulation, for instance, of a multi-storied residential building, former Soviet, is um, uh, let's say from the from the <clears throat> legal uh, and uh, uh, particularly Moldova, from the legal point of view and from the uh, point of view of organizing the contracts, is uh, not a, an easy goer. So we are uh, we have found a solution to that as well. Basically, this is what we are uh, looking at uh, when it comes to pillar number one for our, on our decarbonization agenda, and this is energy efficiency of the buildings. Pillar number two, uh, and again, this is not by chance, as I said, over 50% of the, of the energy spent in, uh, in buildings, <clears throat> and about 35% of the energy is consumed in transport. And of course, most of this transport is uh, private transport, is, is not uh, heavy duty vehicles, is not the planes, is not the trains, uh, is not the tractors, is not agriculture, is, uh, it's uh, personal vehicles. 
And in this respect, Moldova is much better placed uh, than many other countries in Europe uh, from the point of view of, um, let's say, feasibility of uh, uh, electric vehicles, electrification of the transport. Uh, because our transmission grid is uh, robust enough. Uh, about 70% of the population live in individual houses, which is a simpler, where it, it is simply uh, more comfortable to charge the car. Uh, compared to when you live in skyscrapers. Uh, and uh, what happens with, uh, uh, with uh, the re one of the, most, the biggest reasons why we want to, uh, let's say, go into and prioritize uh, the transport is not only because it reduces the immediate or the, the, the direct emissions uh, related to uh, burning of uh, you know, benzene or diesel fuel, but it also allows us uh, to increase the percentage of the renewable energy that we can put on the electric grid. Um, basically, we believe that we can use our electric cars, that we can use electric cars as batteries on wheels and as instruments to actually not only consume from the grid when uh, the energy is abundant and uh, cheap, but to also reduce the consumption from the grid when the energy is uh, scarce uh, and, uh, and uh, expensive. Because uh, there are, it's not science fiction, uh, there are technologies, there are cars already on the market that actually can power your house if the energy in the grid is very expensive and it makes no sense to, or to buy it uh, from your supplier. So basically what we are uh, looking at is uh, with a second pillar with the electrification of transport is not only to uh, switch to electric mobility because it reduces the du direct emissions, but also because it uh, allows us to improve the consumption in the grid and uh, uh, increase the uh, number of renewables that we can actually put on the grid and make the, the entire energy mix much cleaner. Uh, the third pillar is, again, much like in all other countries, the biggest challenge of uh, uh, climate transition of the green electricity is the storage, storage and balancing of the grid. Uh, renewable energy is very great, is actually, in current terms, even competitive in terms of cost with uh, the fossil uh, traditional energy. Uh, the only problem is you, are, uh, you have to uh, cope with its intermittency. So you don't want to depend with your consumption on uh, when there is wind or when, when there is sun. Uh, that's why uh, an emphasis, uh, in our case, we will emphasize not so much the, the uh, balancing, this also, but we believe that uh, the biggest job is to be done by the storage. Uh, and uh, that refers to both using cars as storage, uh, uh, let's say behind meter storage, uh, but also to use industrial or professional, so how should I say it, commercial uh, storage. Uh, if you look today at what happens in many countries, including in Romania, in our uh, neighboring country, uh, they have advanced so much with installation of solar photovoltaics due to net metering schemes, etc., etc., that they are uh, hitting a very, very, uh, you know, uh, standard pattern in uh, summer. If you look at all this summer, Prices for electricity in the morning and in the evening were between 100 and 160 euro per megawatt hour. And during the day when the sun was up, uh, between uh, uh, close, close to zero. That's why, and that actually makes uh, uh, already a business case for commercial storage. That's why it's so important that the, you, we have not only that look at the technical side of it, but we also develop the market. In Moldova, so far, we don't have a, a market operator. We don't have a, 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 an energy exchange. Uh, consumers have a flat 
price for energy regardless when they consume it. That's why it's important, and this is in line with European uh, path, will, is to create these markets not only because, you know, it's, it's, you know, because the European Union says so, but because the markets are the place that send pricing signals that allow consumers, suppliers, and all participants in the market to optimize uh, their investment decisions and to eventually balance the physical energy flows uh, in the grid. I'm very convinced that uh, the future of uh, energy uh, generally is green, and uh, I'm sure that Moldova can actually be, in many respects, uh, jump over or leap over a number of phases that other countries uh, went through and jump straight into the future from the from the Soviet past uh, straight into the uh, decarbonized future because we're smaller because we are uh, uh, we are um, let's say um, we're building everything from scratch and we can build it uh, already with uh, modern and uh, uh, let's say uh, performant technologies. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. Let me express my gratitude for, for, for your input you shared with us today. Um, there was the inauguration of the, of the activities in terms of energy and climate, so I, I, was, I am very happy that you managed to be with us and to take part in that. I hope also that you enjoyed you know, meeting uh, students of the College of Europe tonight. This is a very unique opportunity and, uh, and that you enjoyed also the discussion and the questions you received. So um, thank you very much again for, for being with us and uh, I think we, we should you know, thank you also by, by applause.